Okay, so the last couple of days in class we've been talking about two different types of sampling techniques that we might use when the simple random sample is neither not, not doable or not efficient. And these two samples we've been looking at are cluster samples and stratified samples. They're very similar, yet they have some big differences between them. i got a scenario here that might help you keep those two straight in your head. Let's imagine for a second that you've been hired by um, the city to go and inspect restaurants and look at their vegetables that they serve and their salads, making sure that they're really fresh and nobody gets sick from them. Okay, so there's two types of restaurants. One, like an Outback Steakhouse that has a salad bar. You go up to the salad bar and you pick and choose what toppings you want to put on your salad and you make your own salad. Then there's restaurants like McDonald's that are, the salad is already prepared for you. It's in a box already and you order a uh, chicken salad and they give it to you prepared already. So what kind of sampling would you use if you were to go to Outback Steakhouse? Would you want to use a cluster sample or a stratified sample? So remember, both of them require you to break them up into groups. The cluster sample means that you're going to randomly select the whole group. The stratified sample means that you're going to sort of take a simple random sample of people within that group. So if you were to go to, uh, again, um, Outback Steakhouse, uh, they're already split up into groups for you. You look in the, uh, at the salad bar and all the vegetables are in their own little plates or bowls. So do you want to sample the whole group or do you want to sample a little bit from each group? I hope that you can see that sampling the whole group is not going to be to your benefit at that type of establishment because then you're going to sample all the cucumbers and you're going to ignore the carrots. How do you know if the carrots haven't gone bad or not? So in that situation, you want to take a stratified random sample. You want to take a random sample from each group. You want to take a couple carrots on the plate and a couple cucumbers and a couple whatever, the cheese, toppings, etc. on there, and check them out. Or if you go to McDonald's, you don't want to uh, take a sample of each one because they're all prepared the same, and the salads are all exactly the same. So in that case, you want to take a cluster sample. They're in groups already, but you randomly select the whole group, and you check that salad and make sure all the vegetables are in there. So that will help you keep track of the difference between cluster sampling and stratified sampling. Think of yourself as the salad bar inspector. Okay, here's a study involving the link between ADHD and a link po possibly to lead and mom smoking. It's kind of a lengthy study, so I'm going to ask you to pause the video right now, read through the whole study, and then hit play again when you're done and ready. Okay, I hope you've had a chance to read through this now. Um, but i got some questions here for you about this study. Okay, so the first question is, is this an observation or an experiment? Well, I hope you notice here that they just observed. They didn't actually go in and put lead in anybody's, any mother's body. They didn't ask anybody to smoke. They check on people who are already smoking or already had lead in their system, and they check to see if there was a link to the ADHD. This is an observation. They did not impose any kind of treatment. They didn't ask them to do anything. They just observed. So... We cannot make a conclusion about the link between lead and ADHD. It is not an experiment. Cause and effect cannot be determined in that situation. It's just an observation. So if we really wanted to make this into a cause and effect to try to establish the link there, we'd actually have to go and find some others and expose them to lead or find some mothers who are pregnant and ask them to smoke. There would be obviously some ethical complaints about that. We can't force a person to smoke or a pregnant mother to take lead. So there would be some issues. We probably couldn't actually do that, but that's the only way we could actually establish cause and effect is if we impose some sort of treatment. We actually had the people exposed to lead or smoke cigarettes. Okay, look for the link for the key principles of good experiment and download and if you have access to a printer, you can print this. And we're going to be going over some of the terminology um, when you go to create a good experiment. What are some things that you need to be aware of that will uh, ensure that your results are consistent with a good experiment? Your goal in creating a good experiment is to take your uh, however many groups you have, usually two groups, and make them as similar as possible in every element except whatever it is that you're imposing the treatment on. 
you want the two uh, two groups to be almost identical in terms of gender, in terms of uh, health related race, to height, whatever the factors are that you're looking at, you want them to be as simple as similar as possible. What you want to do is look for lurking variables that occur, and these are are variables that will influence your result. If you put all the males in one group, all the females in another group, then you don't know if your treatment is because they're male or because your treatment is good. Okay, so um, you want to confound, uh, um, you want to prevent those lurking variables to be from becoming confounding variables by balancing them out between the two groups. Okay, so in our um, diet soda experiment here, um, we wanted to prevent sugar from becoming a lurking variable. So we were get we gave one group um, Coke and the other one Diet Coke. Then we measured their average pulse rate. We wouldn't know if it's because of the sugar or because of the caffeine. So that's why we want to give both groups either Diet Coke or both groups regular Coke, so that we can uh, show that the sugar is not what's um, um, affecting the pulse rates. Okay, so to prevent sugar from becoming a confounding variable. We need to make sure that both treatments keep the same amount of sugar. Okay? Um, so here's an example of, um, let's say, imagine that these are two different experiments. In both experiments, one group was given um, soda, and we're me measuring their um, pulse rate. Would you say that the first experiment or the second experiment gives convincing evidence that group B's pulse rate increased higher? Well, if you notice here on both of these graphs here, the center for group A is right around 100, give or take a little bit. And the center for group B, if you notice, is right around 110. So if you just look at the centers, the means or the medians, they're very, very similar in nature. There's not much difference than those. So we, that's not what we need to look at to make this conclusion. But the idea here is if we look at this, we look at this data here in the first experiment, you see how the data is very much centered around 100, and the second experiment is very much centered around 110. Where in the second one, there's great variability here. So yeah, it's centered around 100, but you have a range anywhere from the low 90s up to almost uh, uh, 120 for group A. And for group a, B, you're in the mid-90s, all the way up to almost 125. There's great variability. So this means that we're not as certain or sure about our results. If we can reduce the variability, then we are going to be more certain about our results. For this one, this one has less variability, so we're uh, more confident that our answers are correct, that group B had a higher pulse rate than group A. Okay, there are three principles of good um, experimental design. The first one is direct control. And we basically want to control for all the lurking variables by as much as possible balancing them up between the two groups. And that leads into our second principle, which is randomization. That's how we balance it out. If we use randomization, then we are going to balance out those lurking variables, including the ones that we're not even aware of. Sometimes there are lurking variables in our groups that we had no way of knowing was there. If we use randomization, people aren't going to question that. The third principle is called replication. The idea is that um, we have a large enough sample so that we can make a conclusion about the whole population. And um, so one of the big things is to try to increase the sample size. Um, if we do that, it allows for the randomization to really have a positive effect. A good example is that if I had a sample size of, uh, of 10 and two of them were diabetic, the chances of the two of them, even if I do a random sample, being in the same group are pretty good because the numbers are so low. But if I take 100 people and 20 of them are diabetic, same proportion, 2 out of 10 is the same as 20 out of 100. The chances of all 20 diabetics end up being in the same group are very, very low. 
because of the big sample size. More than likely, you're going to end up with 11 diabetics in one group and 9 in, in the other, or 10 and 10, or something very, very unbalanced. So the bigger the sample size, the more effect that the randomization has. And so replication also means that you can repeat the experiment and get similar results. And if that happens, then we can apply our results to the whole population, even though we only looked at a sample. Okay? Other things to, worry about, um, to be aware of. Not all experiments have a control group, although a lot of them do. Not all of them will. Or use a placebo. Okay? Sometimes you want to co compare your drug to the best drug that's out there. Sometimes you want to compare your drug and just say it's, uh, it, it's effective. So you want to compare it to a placebo. The results of a, an experiment are called statistically significant. if they're unlikely to occur by random chance. For example, in our caffeine experiment, if caffeine really has no effect on pulse rates, then the average pulse rate of the two groups should be similar. Not be necessarily be the same, but it should be the similar. However, because the results will do vary depending on which subject you assign, there, there will be some slight differences. So the question is, is the difference there big enough to say, oh, caffeine has an effect? Or is it just by random chance? So we want to determine if the differences was just by random chance. The natural variability that will occur when you do experiments on real people. Or because there's really a difference in the treatments. The fourth principle is that when you have a known variable that you want to try to account for, we use blocking to try to account for that known variable. And the idea is that you divide them into groups first and you uh, um, separate the treatment groups within those groups. Blocking is basically um, in, is related to experiments the same way as stratifying is to observations. You break them into groups first and then you randomly select people from in those groups. So um, blocking is a great way, like we did in the river problem, we found out that doing it by columns was the way to go because we saw that the plots that were really close to the river had very similar yields and plots very far away from the river also were similar to one another. So if we blocked them by columns and picked one from each column, our average came out to be very close to the true average of the whole population. So some of the keys to randomization. Um, basically, you have two, two chances to randomize, both in your selection of the sample and then also in terms of when you take your sample and split them up into multiple groups and apply the treatment to one and a placebo or to some other um, effect to the other one. So there's two types of excuse me, randomization, your sample and also in terms of who gets the treatment and who doesn't. Okay, If they are both randomized, then you can make inferences about the population and inferences about cause and effect can be made. Okay, If you randomize your sample, but you don't randomize which group they go in, then you can make inferences about the population, but you cannot show cause and effect. If you don't randomize your, your sample, but you randomize which group. And this is what we do many, many times in the science experiment. We take what's there, we randomize which group what each one goes into. You can usually make effects, um, inferences about cause and effect, but not to the whole population, just to your sample that you have there. And then if you don't randomize in either case, neither with your sample or with um, the splitting up of the groups, then this is usually an, infer uh, um, an observation. You can't make any um, inferences about cause and effect, and uh, as I mentioned, these are usually observations. So let's take a look at these four nurse scenarios and figure out which one of these they belong to. So situation, one, uh, situation number one, you get all the students in your AP statistics class to participate in some sort of study. You ask them whether or not they study with music, on and divide them into two groups based on their answer to that question. 
So if you notice, there's no randomization. You went to AP Stats class and you picked everyone. A convenient sample. It was convenient. It's in the class you're in right now. You asked everybody in class. Not random. Then you ask them, you split them into groups based on their answer. Again, it's not random. It's based on what their answer is. So in this case, this is a, similar to an observation. And so this, it, um, I cannot make um, cause and effect kind of um, uh, conclusions. So number two is select a random sample of students from your school to participate in the study, and then you divide them into two groups as in design one. Well, you notice you randomly select your sample, but you did not randomly select which group they go in. Okay, so that would be like this scenario right there. The third scenario, get all your students in AP Stats class to participate in the study. You randomly assign half of the students to listen to music while studying for the entire semester, and you have the remaining half abstain from listening to music. So again, the sample is not random. You're using your AP Stats class, a convenient sample, but you are randomly selecting which treatment to give them. So your treatment is random. Okay, so that would be this scenario right there. And the last one, select a random sample of students from your school and then randomly assign half of the students to listen to music while the other half listen to um, don't listen to music. That's random in both cases. This is the best scenario. Um, we can make inferences about cause and effect. We can try to show that there's a connection between listening to music and their grades that they got in their class. Okay?